There is a deep sense of unease in our rapidly changing world. We all know something has been lost, but we don't know why or where it all leads. Popular culture tells us it is all about me and that we should worship our creations rather than the creator. In politics, the end justifies the means. In relationships, love means self-satisfaction. In life, status and appearance are what count. In the church, confusion replaces clarity and conviction. Our faulty and distorted view of God is at the root of all our problems within and without. But what if we viewed God differently? What if we saw him the way he longed for us to see him? Instead of worshiping a comfortable golden calf of our own creation, we can worship a God that is holy, wise, and just. One whose faithfulness and goodness are matched by his power and sovereignty over all things. This is a God that can deliver us from evil and transform lives. This is a God worth worshiping. The way back, the path of hope, starts with knowing God for who he really is. We need to know the real God. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 12 as we're in week two of the Real God series. And last week, if you missed it, what we did was an introduction to this eight-week series. And we were reminded of a few things last week. One is that we all have a distorted and incomplete view of God that uh, none of us have a perfect view of God, that your view of God, whenever you go to pray, that image that you have in your head, uh, that was formed through many different things, through the way you were raised, the, the kind of the church you grew up in, the preaching you heard, the teaching you were exposed to. Uh, it, it's, your experiences has a lot to do with the way you view God. Uh, the way you read scripture has so much to do with how you view God, and yet the way we, we view God is so important to us, uh, and that we need to get it as correct as we possibly can, because the way you view God determines what you believe about yourself. How you view God determines how you pray, uh, what you believe about eternity, what you believe about good and bad. And, and so these eight weeks that we're in is to help us get a better view of who God really is. We also talked last week that the only way we can know God is through the way that he has revealed himself. And uh, he has revealed himself enough for us to really know so much more about who he is and be uh, a lot more correct in the way we think about him. In 2008, USA Today published a, a study that uh, Baylor University did. They did a four-year uh, study on America's view of God. And what was interesting when they got the results is that um, 5% of Americans in 2008 self-identified as atheists. 95% of Americans had a view of God. But what was really interesting is that there, it, the diversity of the views. In fact, they kind of put them in four different quadrants, and, and it's almost broke down 25% in each one of these quadrants. There's, there are people in that their view of God in America is that God was the creator, but once he created, he kind of left us on our own, and, and we are what we make of ourselves. We have no help. We need to determine, it's kind of really almost the survival of the fittest, and, and they don't even have an answer for eternity. About a quarter of Americans in 2008, we would call these deists, that they believe that there's a God, they believe he created, but that was it, and that's all he'll ever do. There's the, another group, they believed in the creator God, uh, but they really didn't believe that God was active in the world today, but they do believe that there will be a, de a day where God will judge and he will make all things right. But uh, in the meantime, we're on our own to do what we have to do. Now, and they said really that this group, is not even, God's not concerned about the fears of the world uh, and the fact that he's not going to be um, active in our lives, but he will one day judge the world which is an interesting view when you think about the fact that God sent his son to the world because we messed up so much that, that he came and walked among us. 
The third view was that there is a God, uh, that he's active in the world, but he's primarily a God of wrath, that he judges, and that uh, almost to the, to the point of uh, he is looking, he's an angry God who's just waiting to see how we rebel, and he brings judgment and punishment and wrath on our rebellion. And then uh, the last group, uh, about a quarter of those uh, said, no, he is a God who's active, and he's a loving God, that, that he's a benevolent God, and that he is a, a good God. Now, it's obvious that as a culture, we're all over the map when it comes to who God is and who is the real God. And what's interesting is that there is at least a little bit of truth in every one of those. God is the creator. God will judge one day, that, that God is a God of wrath and discipline, but he is a loving and a good God. And so we want to take all of what the Bible says about how he revealed himself and what we know about God and learn about the real God through seven attributes. Today we're going to start with the first attribute, and that is the goodness of God. In fact, we say it in church, we'll say God is good, all the time, and all the time, God is good, right? So we, we even sing a song, he's a good, good father. Yes, he is. And, and, and so we're going to look at the goodness of God. Look at what the psalmist said in Psalm 105. He said, for the Lord is good, and his faithful love endures forever. His faithfulness through all generations. Now, here's going to be the struggle for us when we think about these attributes. We filter all of these attributes in through the way that they affect us and, and, and our life experiences. But what we have to understand, God is who God is regardless of what we think about it or how we filter who he is. And so the first attribute, when we say God is good, what we really are meaning is that God is the final standard of good, that we define good through God, and that God, uh, everything that God does is good. In fact, the, the idea that God is all good can be called omnibenevolence, and, and we understand that God is good, he is pure, he is complete complete. We don't compare God's goodness against badness. Now, as humans, that's, what, that's how we define good. Uh, the way you and I define good is, is how does it compare to what's bad, right? So we'll say, I'm a good person because I'm not as bad as the person up the road. And so that's how we define good, that the magic are bad because they're not as good as most of the teams in the NBA, right? But just think about how crazy it is how we define good. If you're in baseball as a batter, you can fail 700% of the time and get million-dollar contracts if you can just be good 300% of the time. And we'll say, oh, that's a great, that is a good batter. No, he fails 700. That's how, how off our definition of goodness is. And so, so God is pure and complete and good. In fact, God cannot be not good. I know that's not correct English, but I like the way it sounds, right? God is incapable of being not good. He is good and unable, he's not able to live um, in, uh, outside of who he is. In fact, James reminds us of this in James 1, 7. He says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights who does not change like shifting shadows. In our small groups, and I hope you're in one, in your small groups, you're going to talk and discuss in your small groups about how God has revealed his goodness to us. Again, we know God by the way he reveals himself to us. And so in your small groups, you're going to talk this week about how God reveals his goodness to us. But what I want us to do this morning is, first of all, talk about what happens when we forget how good God is. In, in fact, uh, Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2 says this, My soul bless the Lord, and all that is within me bless his holy name. 
my soul bless the Lord and do not what? Forget all his benefits. Another way of saying this is do not forget how good he really is. And let me just say, it's easy for us to forget how good God is. It's one of the reasons we take communion on a regular basis, to remember his love, to remember his goodness, to remember what he has done for us. And so, but there are at least three things that we need to be aware of that can happen in our lives if we forget how good God is. The first in your notes is I start taking credit for what God has done. I start taking credit for what God has done. I ask you to turn to Luke 12, and I want to start in verse 13. Someone from the crowd said to him, Teacher, my brother, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Friend, he said to him, who appointed me a judge or arbiter over you? Then he, t- then he told them, watch out and be on your guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. And then look at verse 16. Then he told them this parable. A rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have, uh, since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I'll do this, he said, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is is demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? That is how it will be for the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Understand this parable. Here's what Jesus says. There was a rich man who was already rich. God had been incredibly good to this man. And he plants, and this year his harvest is beyond expectation. And so now God has been good to him. He's a rich man, and God even blesses him more. But nowhere in this parable does this man give God any credit. Nowhere in this parable does he even ask God, why would you bless me this much? Why would you be this good? Uh, He just thinks it's all about him. And he's forgotten the goodness of God. And so he says, I'm just going to build bigger barns and store it all up so that I can just kind of sit back and relax and enjoy life. Well, then why in the parable did God say, man, that is so foolish? It's because he forgot the goodness of God. You see, the farmer might argue, wait, time out, man. I'm the one who had all the seed. I'm the one who had it planted. He probably didn't plant it, had servants plant it. I'm the one who made sure that uh, we took care of it and, and that the, you know, we harvested it. That's mine. And yet, think about reality. Who produced a seed that could produce a plant? Who made soil with such conditions that it could create the plant and cause a harvest? Who brought the conditions of rain and the right weather conditions to make sure that that crop was big? See, God had been good to this man, and because this man did not understand God and recognize God's goodness, he thought he did it on his own. God said, how foolish is that? You die tonight, and it goes to somebody else, and you've missed out on my goodness. See, when we forget the goodness of God, we start to take credit for what God has done. And so one of the exercises you may want to do this week, if you don't do it already, is get a piece of paper and start writing all the ways God has been good to you. Man, when you're tempted to complain, go back and look at that paper. When you recognize more that God has done, add to that paper. Let it be a part of your quiet time and recognize how good God has. Look, the fact that you're living in America at this time uh, ought to top the list. When you understand some places you could live and some, some times you could live in. The second thing, if I quit remembering how good God is, I, I could live in anxiety and fear. 
It could cause me to live with anxiety and fear. Look, to the Christian, the goodness of God is the basis of our security. It's the basis of our peace, knowing that God is good. When Joshua was about to enter into the promised land, leading the Israelites into the promised land, God says to Joshua, haven't I commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid or discouraged, for I, the Lord God, am with you wherever you go. And the fact that God is with me and that God is a good God should lead me to this question, what in the world do I have to fear or be anxious about if God is with me always and if he is a good God? If all we knew about God was the goodness of God, that would be huge. But what makes this even more powerful is that we know God is a loving God. God is a just God. God is also an all-powerful God and an ever-present God. And if he is truly good, and if he is with me all the time, I should rest in that and find peace in that. The third thing that will happen if I forget the goodness of God is I'll make myself my God. See, when we forget that God is good, we def- then we determine what's good and we define goodness. And there's a tendency for us to determine uh, what, what good is on our terms. And in the process, we've made ourselves uh, the God of our lives, that we've defined what truth is. And we've defined what's best. And every one of us tend to worship uh, our goodness when, as we define it as opposed to the way God defines it. In fact, in Acts 20, Herod uh, says he gave a speech. And the people, I don't know what the speech was. We don't have the speech, but it was a powerful speech. And the people started yelling, you're more than a man, you're a god. And because Herod had for, probably never knew the goodness of God, and he took that on himself as, yeah, I'm, I really am. God set an example, and he set an angel who struck Herod down immediately, and it, the word says that his body was eaten by worms. Uh, because God does not want to share his glory, we need to remember that he is a good God. And when we forget that, makes life tougher. So that being said, I want to deal real quickly with the elephant in the room, and that's this. If God truly is good, then why does evil exist? If God truly is good, then why did my child get cancer? If God truly is good, then why did my spouse walk out on me? If God is a good God, then why do all of these things happen? Well, Obviously, that's a really deep subject, but let me give you three reasons why that, um, and look, it's a complicated issue, but these three, three, three reasons will help to put in perspective why bad things happen. In your notes, first of all, we just live in a fallen world. The garden was paradise. The garden was perfect. There was no cancer in the garden. There were no natural disasters in the garden. Uh, There was no um, mental diseases in the garden. And the garden was paradise. But when Adam and Eve chose to rebel against God and sin, there were consequences to those sins. In fact, God told Adam, because of this sin, man, life is not going to be easy. You're going to toil for the food that you eat, and there are going to be challenges, and and it's going to require sweat to get the food that you're going to eat. And because we're not in paradise anymore, because we live in a fallen world, um, bad things happen. Natural disasters, diseases, sicknesses. The world we live in now is not the world that God intended. It's a result of our rebellion against him. Now, there is one day he's going to make it all right again, a new heaven and a new earth. But right now, we live in a fallen world. 
And many times the hard things in our life aren't really anyone's fault. It's just a result of living in a world that is marred by sin. So we build a house by the seashore, a hurricane comes and destroys our home, and people want to blame God for our home being destroyed. In fact, we even say that's an act of God. No. We live in a fallen world. There are natural disasters. You built your home someplace where hurricanes come, and, you're, and a hurricane did what a hurricane did, and now you want to blame God for it. No, that's a part of living in a fallen world. Um, bad things are going to happen because of the, of the result of sin in our world. People, cancer is a result of the way that we have destroyed God's paradise. And so some of what happens in our lives are just because we live in a, in a fallen world that's marred by sin. The second reason bad things happen is the consequences of sin, both our sins and the sins of others. It's amazing to me how somebody can drink for 40 years or smoke for 40 years or uh, never really eat right or exercise, and something happens, and the first thing they do is feel like, why, why did God allow this to happen to me? Well, because you drank for 40 years, you smoked for 40 years, you never exercised, and you ate fatty food for 40 years. It's a result of our choices that we make in our lives. And yet there are those who have an attitude, yeah, even if I mess it up, God should never let me suffer for the consequences of my own actions. Well, he does. God is also not just good, but he's just, and he's wise, and he's given us truth. And when we refuse to live by the truth, we pay the consequences. And so I deal with the result of not only my sins, but even the sins of others. So a guy gets on the highway, and he gets drunk, and he crosses the center line, and he, he hits a car head on, and the family's killed and he walks away it's the result of sin and the consequences of sin bad things happen because of my bad decisions or i get caught up in the backwash of somebody else's sins but there's also a third reason why bad things happen that seem bad that really are good things and that's god's discipline as his children, the Bible says God disciplines those that he loves. And so sometimes what's going on in our life that feels bad is really a good thing, and it comes from the love and the goodness and the mercy and the grace of God because he doesn't want us to continue to live in rebellion, and he brings discipline to bring us back to him. So what's our response to the goodness of God is by faith to trust in the goodness of God. By faith, we're to trust in the goodness of God. Look at Matthew 7, 11. It says this, If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? How can he do that? Because he is a good God. And here's what I would say. He is a good God, whether we believe it or not. He is a good God, regardless of the circumstances we're going through. He is a good God, no matter how much we may want to rail against that, he is good. And many times, and I would say most of the times in my life, it's very easy for me to know the goodness of God. But even in those times where things happen that don't make sense, I'm to trust in the goodness of God. Because guess what? One day they will make sense. And, and, and I just walk by faith and trust in his goodness. And let me tell you, if, since God is good, and since God is the father to all who have surrendered their lives to him, and Matthew, Jesus said, how much more will your Father give you good things? How can we not worship him? 
How can we not trust in him? When I forget God's goodness, it leads to pride and self-sufficiency. When I remember the goodness of God, it leads to worship. Let's thank God for how good he really is. Let's pray. Father, this morning we, um, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the way you've displayed that in so many ways. And God, that we can know your goodness every day. And God, your goodness even helps us through the times where we don't have answers to what's going on because we know ultimately, God, that, that you're good and you're working all things out for your good. And so help us, God, to rest in that when the tough times come and help us to rejoice in it when we feel it and know it. And then through all of it, help us to worship you as the good God that you truly are. In Jesus' name, amen.